After nearly two days of fierce fighting came to an end, residents of Janine refugee camp ventured out from their homes today. Work to repair the damage began. This central street, largely destroyed in the Israeli army assault, using drone strikes, bulldozers and hundreds of troops as they hunted down militants who had grown increasingly bold. Bullet holes. Soldiers took over Muhammad's family home. Their belongings now strewn across the floor. He shows me graffiti scrawled on a wall tapestry. A hole blasted through their neighbor's wall. That's how Israeli forces moved house to house, avoiding open streets. His wife, Rima, and more than a dozen members of her extended family were trapped, terrified, in a single room. They cut the electricity, they cut the water. There was no air and it was very dark. One of our daughters fainted. There were two teenage boys. They handcuffed them and took them to another room. I have a little baby. He was crying like crazy. I didn't know what to do for him. The level of destruction here really is pretty massive. The Israeli army has hailed this operation as a success, saying it discovered more than a thousand weapons. But you've got to wonder what long-term impact that's really going to have on the militant groups it says it was targeting. If anything, all this is likely just to further fuel the anger, further fuel the resentment that had already been building. Guns the Israelis didn't seize were on display this afternoon at funeral processions for some of the 12 Palestinians killed here. The Israeli army says all of them were militants, but at least one appeared unarmed in a video that captured the moment he was shot. Mourners from across the occupied West Bank came to express solidarity and anger. 20 years ago, yeah. there was a major operation in Janine refugee camp. Yes, yes. Back then, it was part of the second intifada. Yes. Now, a lot of people feel very angry, but we haven't yet seen another intifada. Why is that? What you are seeing here now, what we are seeing here, it is just a spark. Janine is a spark. Janine yeah. is a spark. Go to the brain of everyone here. We are, we are, I'm 60 years old, okay? I should not think like that, but they, they are killing my children. I'm, I'm seeing the ladies came, coming out of their houses last night. They could not find anything. They could not move. They are shooting with them. They are occupying their houses. And there's a new target for popular anger, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. Stones thrown at a government building by young men this afternoon. and a crowd chanting for visiting officials to get out of the camp. Many here resent the aging Palestinian leadership and President Abu Mazin. They want them to abandon their more diplomatic approach and support the militant groups. People are not happy with Abu Mazin at the no, moment? No, we are not happy. Every, every day they're killing people in Jenin. What do we have to do? Okay. My, I have 20 French martyrs. Okay, Abu Mazin can, can uh, give me them. I, I don't know. I spent in the jail two years. What he made for me, I don't know. Okay, I'm studying university. I finished all my study. What I have to do now? I don't have a job. I don't have anything. One Israeli soldier was killed last night in clashes as the army withdrew. Whilst this military vehicle was struck by a powerful blast. The troops were cheered by settlers at one point. Dozens of attacks on Israelis have been carried out by men from Jenin, and many believe the only solution is using force. The Israeli army said it did as much as it could not to harm civilians in Jenin or their property. There are large parts of the camp not damaged in the raid, but everyone here feels under attack. Positions on both sides have been hardening. This operation might be over, but the bloodshed isn't. Well, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tonight said that the raid in Jenin 
had meant that the area is no longer, in his words, a safe haven for terrorists and describing it as a first step with further action to follow. There's no doubt that the raid has weakened the militants, the resistance fighters, as many Palestinians see them, but they're still here and so too are the underlying grievances around the Israeli occupation that drive support for them. I think it's important to just step back and, and appreciate and underline really how significant an escalation we've seen in recent days. The uh, Israeli airstrikes that we've seen on Janine refugee camp, we haven't seen uh, those kind of airstrikes for around two decades in the West Bank and so too uh, the, the kind of open anger that we've seen some Palestinians start expressing against their own political leadership, that's something new and very significant. One other element further complicating this already complex picture is the internal divisions within Israel over the government's controversial plans for judicial reform and tonight the police chief in Tel Aviv which has been seen to the largest protest against those plans has been removed from his post. Many suspect that's because he hasn't clamped down on the protesters in the way uh, that many in the government have wanted him to do so. Demonstrations there already building. Sikanda, thanks very much indeed. Well, last night we spoke to Israel's deputy ambassador here in the UK. I'm joined now by the Palestinian ambassador, Hassam Zomlod. Thank you very much for coming to the studio. You heard it then, Sikanda's piece. What must be worrying for you representing the Palestinian Authority is it increasingly, and I found this myself when I was in Gaza a few years ago, ordinary Palestinians do not feel that their authority, the Palestinian Authority, represent them or can protect them, and there's real anger against them now. The ordinary Palestinians do feel unprotected, exposed to Israeli brutality, as we have just seen. But also unprotected and, uh, by the people that you represent. They, they feel unprotected, and uh, 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 we should feel uh, uh, with them, and uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, we should find ways to provide them with that protection. Because under such circumstances, under such unhinged brutality and attacks, the Palestinian people deserve protection. It's their right and it's our obligation. The issue is that the PA was established as a very interim entity mm. to undergo our commitment, the PLO commitment, yeah. under the Oslo Accords. And the, the PA was supposed to become the, the state after five years, as you very uh, well known. Then by then, the state will have its own army, mm. and the army will protect the people. And that has so, never happened. And that has never happened because Israel and its allies in mm. the West has allowed almost 30 years with undermining that prospect. And we are in that, in that very gray area at the moment, but the Palestinian people have the absolute right of protection. And that's why the alternative, until we get Israel's occupation ended, until we establish a state, is we seek international protection. But the blue hats, that is what is... is, is, is and is, and is, you're not going to get is, that either, right? No, so that, why, why shouldn't right. we get that? But it's, the point it's is that... Even... Mat it's an international obligation. Yeah. It happened in so many areas. We have so many UN forces mm. around Palestine, mm. actually, between Egypt and Palestine. But as we know, the United Nations is toothless on a number of issues, including on this one. But the question is this. In the interim, as you describe it, the extremes are getting more, you know, more vocal, more representative, and the middle ground, which is the only ground on which there can be a solution, is more relevant. Yeah, especially in Israel. We've just seen the report. I mean, you have a government that is not only fanatics, it has ministers that are convicted even in Israeli courts mm. as racist, like Ben Gvir, and you have... But you haven't had an election uh, since uh, 2005. Uh, since 2005, uh, uh, you've not had an election and we should in the have, West Bank. And we should have elections, and we have always... But you keep uh, postponing them. We have always pride ourselves. We are one of the few in the region who hold elections. You mm. were there, you know. Uh, and, you know, every time we convene elections, we run the wall of the Israeli occupation wanting to dictate and the rest of the world uh, uh, deciding on the outcome. So in 2006, when we had a free elections, mm. Hamas won, and then all of a sudden the international community boycotted the government. And then the, the, the last round last year, uh, Israel prevented us from convening elections in Jerusalem, rounded and arrested anyone who would campaign for elections. We cannot convene elections without Jerusalem and Gaza. Even the late Hanan uh, Ashwari, you know, who was a, you know, a grand Palestinian, said this is an excuse for the Palestinian Authority not to go to the polls because they're afraid of losing to Hamas. Well, if Jerusalem is an excuse, I'm happy to take it. But it's a very, a very serious issue. Jerusalem is the heart of the matter. You've lived there. 
every peace process has failed because of Jerusalem. We will not accept to give Israel a full veto power over Jerusalem to exclude 350,000 Palestinian Jerusalemites from the democratic process. But process. if you don't have the however, mandate to the people, however, how can you represent you them? You are right. However, we must find ways to convene elections. I agree. Nothing is needed at this point more the, than the democratic renewal and going back to our people and hearing from our youth and they decide what direction the Palestinians. Because people. that youth is turning against you in big numbers. That, that youth are angry uh, with a sense of help, hopelessness. There is hopelessness and helplessness in the streets of Jenin, in Nablus, and what in Khalil, in Gaza, what can you do about, Gaza, that? In, you in do about that? All over. Uh, what, what we need to do, we need to reassess all of mm. our commitments. In the 80s, when you were covering already mm. Palestine, the late Yasser Arafat, and uh, his, his, his colleagues and mm. the leadership engaged the Europe and the US, and the, okay. that engagement brought about a two-state solution. That was never a Palestinian demand, it's a Palestinian concession. Okay. And the international community failed to enforce its own policies, and there has been double standards all okay. along, you know. We, we know that, and there have been, and we could carry on, but we can't because we run out of time. Ambassador Zomna, thank you very much indeed. You're most welcome. Well, let's go to Jackie and Leeds with more on the situation in Janine. Jackie. Thanks, Matt. Now, it's only a small township, so what is the significance of Janine in this long-running conflict? Well, there are 19 Palestinian refugee camps that have been set up over the decades in the West Bank, according to the UN. But time and again, it's Janine that sees the most violent and deadly clashes with Israeli forces. Conflict there isn't anything new, stretching back more than 70 years. The camp in Janine was originally set up to house thousands of dispossessed Palestinians after the State of Israel was established in 1948. Over decades it grew, transforming into a small township rather than a traditional camp and is now home to about 23,000 people. Its citizens, often third or fourth generation, have frequently expressed anger at being treated as refugees within their own home, left powerless and poor. And all around them, Israel has forged ahead with the construction of new illegal West Bank settlements. Just last month, its government approved another 5,000 new homes. Living under the constant threat of eviction, often unemployed and disenfranchised, Janine has become a notorious hotbed for what Palestinians consider armed resistance and Israelis call terrorism. The camp in Janine was the arena of some of the worst bloodshed during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, Many of the suicide bombers who led the uprising came from here. In response, Israeli forces carried out a devastating raid on the camp, killing 52, half of whom were civilians. More than 20 years later, an almost identical scenario is playing out again. The Israeli government has insisted this one, though, was a targeted operation, the former prime minister describing it as a tweezer-like attack. I asked Tamara Al-Rifai from UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for Palestine's six million refugees, whether that was realistic when I spoke to her earlier. Any fighting in a densely populated area always deals a big blow to the neighborhood, to the infrastructure, to the homes of people, to their livelihoods, and to their psychological well being. Our team at UNRWA, the UN uh, Agency for Palestine Refugees, went in today to start to look at the scale of the damage and to start to look at the needs of the population that was there and to start to plan our return because for the last two days we were not able to carry out our basic critical services. Now for the record, UNRWA runs basic services, public-like services, schools, health centers, um, food distribution in Palestine refugee camps. There are 19 of them in the West Bank, in the occupied West Bank. I mean, you talk about your organisation going back in, you've not been able to be there. Some of the people who are living there, who had nowhere to flee, talking to our team on the ground, have been very critical of your agency. They're asking, you know, where were you in the run-up to this operation? Um, where were you when the Israelis were making clear there would be this sort of attack? They feel abandoned by you. Is that fair? That is fair to say for anyone who has just undergone the kind of events of the last two days. It is fair to expect that such events do not happen and it is fair to expect that humanitarian organizations would get in. From a humanitarian organization perspective, it is not possible to access across a cross line, ac across active hostilities. So for the last two days, our teams 
were, have been trying to get in and it has not been possible. However, part of our team lives in Janine Camp. We have, I have colleagues who come from Janine Camp and with whom we've been in contact over the last two years. Today, that team from Janine Camp and my colleagues from our office in East Jerusalem were all together in Janine Camp trying to assess what they're going to roll out as of tomorrow. I mean, briefly, if you would, your agency does face a real problem in terms of how much it will be able to do for the people who have just been through so much. The blunt truth is you don't have enough funds. You've just raised 100 million of the 300 million you need. Why are donor countries so reluctant to help? There are a variety of reasons. There is um, a bit of disengagement at the global level from the Israel-Palestine conflict altogether. There is competition for lack of a better word, with other humanitarian crises. Um, there is a crisis, which is the Palestine uh, refugee um, cause crisis that has been going on for far too long for younger policymakers to remember the origin of it, which is a conflict unresolved. You said it, we are facing immense funding problems. These are gonna get worse now because of the Janine situation. It is extremely urgent for our donors, our partners, to come to our rescue and to the rescue of UNRWA. Do you think that some donors just don't want to go anywhere near this trouble? They don't want to go anywhere near this conflict? Indeed, in the list of priorities of conflicts in the world, this one is no longer in the top five, unfortunately. And so that lack of interest, plus intense politicizing of the um, Israel-Palestine conflict makes it difficult to support us. Tamara Al-Rafai, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you.